Mission Impossible is an American television series that chronicled the exploits of a small team of secret government agents known as the Impossible Missions Force. If you grew up in the 60s and 70s, you probably remember this TV show. The Impossible Missions, Missions Force was used against covert governments, hostile Iron Curtain governments, third world dictators, evil organizations, and later crime lords. Each episode, if you recall, opened with a fast paced montage of clips from the episode as the series theme music played. And when I mentioned Mission Impossible, those of uh, you of that age probably remember the music. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah coming back to you, isn't it? The opening scene almost invariably showed someone receiving instructions from a voice on a tape recorder, which then self-destructs. The series aired on CBS from September 1966 to March 1973. It was revived in 1988 for two seasons on ABC. The younger crowd probably knows Mission Impossible from a series of movie starring Tom Cruise, which began in 1996. The first chapter of the book of Acts records the resurrected Christ preparing his apostles for a seemingly impossible mission. Of course, we know that mission to be to evangelize the known world in their day. Jesus, of course, has been resurrected by this point, and he's appeared over a period of 40 days. Luke tells us in the early verses of chapter one here, uh, proving he's resurrected from the dead, and he gathers his, his apostles together and tells them to wait in Jerusalem for what the Father had promised, which they'd heard of from him. He says, in a few days, uh, you'll receive what the Father promised baptism in the Holy Spirit. We want to focus primarily as we begin here on Acts chapter 1 verses 6 through 8. The apostles are gathered. Uh, it says when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Well, these men, of course, were raised in Jewish homes, and when Jesus spoke of the promise of the giving of the spirit, their minds immediately went to the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, because that is what God had promised through many Old Testament prophets, people like Joel in Joel chapter 2, people like prophets like Ezekiel in chapter 37. The spirit was tied in the Jewish mind to this restoration. And so they hear of this and they tell Jesus, well, they are asked Jesus, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you, will both, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. What an audacious, incredible mission task, right? Jesus had spent three or three and a half years training these men for this very thing, but they were still, you know, had their, their issues. But you know, there's a sense in which every one of us as a Christian are, men, are missionaries. No, not in the same sense the apostles were, but I believe we're all called to a mission. Your mission may differ from what God wants me to do, and, and that's certainly possible. But being a missionary for Christ, can be an incredibly difficult job. But if we know some things, it will be easier if we approach it with the following principles in mind. Just admitting the fact that being a missionary for Christ can be difficult. But if we look here to Acts chapter one, verses six through eight, as Jesus calls these group, this group of men to a mission, I think there's some things we learn from this text some principles, if you will, that will help us in our mission for the Lord. Principle number one would be to accept 
God's sovereignty. Accept God's sovereignty. See, serving God as a member of his mission team starts with recognizing that he is God and I am not. God is the one on the throne of the universe, not me. You might be thinking, well, this is, this is obvious. Yes, it is, but it is also so easy to, fall, excuse me, to fall into the trap of thinking that I'm in charge somehow. You ever struggled with that as a Christian? Somehow I get to call the shots that I need to know and be informed of all the details of what God is doing. See, the apostles had questions about the timing of the restoration of the kingdom, right? Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? But in response, Jesus calmly but firmly says, in effect, you know, that's God's business, not yours. The times and the epics are up to God. The Bible over and over again, of course, affirms the sovereignty of God over the universe. Places like Psalm 115, verse 3, when it says, but our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Some of us maybe try to live our life that way, and it doesn't work out so well. But if you're God, it's certainly true. You can do as you please, because whatever God pleases is the right thing. In Psalm 135 and verse 6, it says nearly the same thing, but in just a little bit different way. It says, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the sea, and in all the deeps. That's a verse highlighting this sovereignty of God. God is the sovereign over the world, over the universe, he can do as he pleases, wherever, whatever the realm. That's what Daniel highlights, in, or Nebuchadnezzar rather, in Daniel 4, verse 35. Dan, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, of course, was uh, a ruler who was full of himself, who probably believed that he could do as he pleased. And from a human standpoint, Nebuchadnezzar at that time in world history probably did much of what he wanted. But due to God's intervention in his life, he came to the point where he would say this, Daniel 4, verse 35, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But he, speaking of God, says he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? It's pretty audacious for the created to ask the creator, why have you done this? What have you done? I'm reminded as well of the lesson Job learned by the end of the Old Testament book uh, telling his story. Job spends much of the book, you know, uh, challenging God in a lot of ways, and that doesn't scare God off. But you reach verse or chapter 38 of Job through about chapter 41. And Job, if you know, in a figurative sense, sits, uh, God sits Job down and says, you know what, you need to be quiet for a moment and let me ask you some questions. But at the end of all of that, in Job 42, verses 1 through 3, it says, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this? Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that I did not, that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, things I did not know. After this encounter with the sovereignty of God, Job says, you know what? I've probably said too much by this point. And as you and I serve God, we need to accept that there are things, as we say, that are above our pay grade. And I trust God to work those things out without my counsel or understanding. Again, we're talking here about the first principle to make our job as a missionary for God a little bit easier is, is just to affirm, to accept the fact that God is sovereign over the universe, that he doesn't have to answer our questions if he doesn't want to. If there's nothing we need to know, then that's fine. We're called to do what God calls us to and to trust him for, again, the things that he keeps to himself. So number one, accept God's sovereignty. Number two, another principle that will help make our mission work easier is to access God's power. Access God's power. 
You see, serving God as a member of his mission team is only accomplished through his power and resources. God calls people to some incredible missions, but he also provides incredibly for them. Sure, we've all, we all have our different strengths, our unique strengths that God can use to accomplish his purposes. We all have a unique set of resources that God can access to move his agenda forward. We're not saying that we don't, but we do need to understand that even those strengths and resources that we claim, guess what? They have their origin in him. So yes, I may have a certain amount of resources and abilities, but they're God-given as well. You see, the apostles back in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, they were standing there on the threshold of a mission that likely seemed overwhelming to them. And we don't know what was going through their minds specifically, but it's easy for me to imagine, you know, Jesus is getting ready to leave them. And now he's saying, you know what? I want you to evangelize the world. I can imagine, you know, just knowing human nature, I can think they probably says, wow, what, how in the world are we going to do this? But you know what? Jesus didn't respond to their question. If they were thinking these things in their mind, Jesus didn't tell them there in Acts 1, here's your job, you figured it out. Instead, what did Jesus do? Jesus reassured these men that God's power and resources would be available to them. Did you catch that back there in Acts 1? After telling them, it's not for you to know the times and epochs which the Father is fixed by his own authority. So he says, leave that to God. But he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That was the promise of God. God's power and resources were going to be available to back up their mission. The Bible affirms the fact that, that God, of course, is a God of great resource and a God of great power, and he shares it with those that serve him. Psalm 84, verse 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. And notice this, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk up, uprightly. So if we're seeking to serve God in a righteous way, God will provide for that service. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, the apostle Peter there, by this time in his ministry, had learned some things. He affirms to his readers, he says, his or God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. It's by God's divine power that he provides everything we need for life and godliness or a godly life. I think how your version puts that. Everything. That's the resources of God. That's the power behind the throne. That's what we find Paul referring to in Ephesians chapter 6. When he says in verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. It goes on to talk about you know, the armor of the warrior of God. But we're to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, not in our own strength and resources. I need to remember as I serve God that I know and that you know I know that he supplies those that he sends, and I need to trust that. If God has a task for me. I'm confident that he will provide the power and the resources I need to accomplish it. Now, God may do those things in a measure that I don't expect, or I may think should be different, but that doesn't mean God doesn't provide. He will. No good thing will he withhold from those who, who walk uprightly. So however God chooses to do it, remember that's up to the sovereign God, but he has promised to do it. And as a missionary for the Lord, I need to access that power on my own. Principle number three, to make our mission work easier. Number three is to acknowledge God's plan. Acknowledge God's plan. 
Serving God as a member of his mission team means that he determines what needs to be accomplished. He's the team leader. He charts the course. He files the flight plan. You pick your metaphor, however you, you like to do it. God is the one in charge. As mission team members with God, we are the hands and feet that God uses to carry out his missions, his plans, his purposes, his will. And we need to acknowledge that plan rather than rail against it or push back against it. Once again, the apostles in Acts chapter 1 were tasked with being witnesses of the resurrection, resurrected Christ, weren't they? After, after telling them you will receive power for the mission, Jesus outlines what the plan is. You shall be my witnesses. Witnesses of the resurrected Christ. It would be those men who would lead the early church in sharing the good news about Jesus. God determined what needed to be done and chose valued team members to do what needed to be done. That's the way it works in, among God's missionaries. Again, as a child of God, you and I also have a mission. You may still have trouble accepting this fact, but you do. You know, maybe not in the sense that you leave your home and go to a foreign country like so many other brave men and women do and and immerse yourself in a foreign culture and eat different food and all of that. You know, God bless the men and women with the courage to do those kind of things. But just because you and I may be not doing that doesn't mean we're not a missionary. We have a mission from God. You likely didn't receive it personally from the Lord like these men in Acts chapter 1. But through the word of God, you have been given a mission. You see it in places like John 13, 35, where we, in a sense, as followers of Christ, testify to the risen Christ. How? By loving one another. That's mission work. John 13, 35 says, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I believe that's a, that's a directive from God to every child of God, to love one another. And that's a testimony. That's a witness. We bear witness to the risen Christ as missionaries by being productive in the kingdom of God. In John 15, this time, verse 8, Jesus says, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Again, spoken there to the apostles primarily, but I believe it's a call for every Christian to be fruitful. And that becomes a testimony, a mission testimony, to the risen Christ. We bear witness to the risen Christ by continuing in the word of God. In John 8, verse 31, Jesus says, he was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. So once again, it's a testimony to the risen Christ when we continue to serve as he's instructed. As you and I serve God, as I serve God, I endeavor to do by his power and grace all that he calls me to do. What we're affirming here in this principle is that God is the mission planner. I am the mission doer or servant. That's the proper roles. We're saying here that as a missionary, I need to acknowledge God's plan. It's not my plan. God may allow us to have a role in that, but God's the mission planner. And I just as well acknowledge that. It'll make my job a whole lot easier. Finally, principle number four for making our mission work easier, making a tough job easier, is to aim for God's target. Aim for God's target. Serving God as a member of his mission team means embracing, embracing the scope or range of his mission, even when it may seem difficult or out of reach. The apostles' call to be witnesses of the risen Lord may have seemed challenging, enough on its own merits, right? When Jesus told them, you're going to be my witnesses, even that was a challenging thought, perhaps. But those men in Acts chapter 1 hadn't heard it all yet. The witness, according to Jesus, was to be taken where? Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Literally, if you will, the ends of the earth is what Greek is saying. 
all of a sudden now, the mission for these men just got more challenging, didn't it? It's one thing to be a witness for Christ. It's one thing to take it as far as you can go. But to their credit, the apostles, as the book of Acts goes on to record, accepted their mission, and by the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit, they did take it as far as the Lord directed. This may be surprising to you, but in the first century, these men in the early church did what God called them to do. We find it referenced even in the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, of course, is devoted to Jesus's uh, warnings to the early church about the coming destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. But, you know, as part of what he was saying there, he gave them some signs to watch for and give them some instructions when they saw certain things. But in Matthew 24, verse 14, it says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Well, I believe the end here, again, in context, is talking about uh, the end of the old covenant system with the destruction of the temple. It's not till you get to verses 35 and 36 where, you know, it talks there about there are going to be some alive that's going to see what Jesus is talking about. Anyway, Jesus alluding to this very work of accomplishing this mission. It's even more clear in places like Colossians chapter 1 verse 23 in the words of Paul. Colossians 1 23 says, picking up in the middle of a thought in Paul's letter, it says, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard. So the, the subject here is the gospel. And what does Paul say about that? Read on the verse. It says, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Did you catch the past tense there? Speaking of the gospel, Paul says, it was proclaimed, was proclaimed in all creation under heaven. The apostles did what their mission leader called them to do. We see it at the end of the book of Romans as well. Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. There Paul says, Now to him who is able to establish you by the, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the ministry, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but is now manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith. Once again, these men accepted their mission and they aimed at the target God gave them. And the Bible records by God's power that they were able to do that. Once again, being part of God's mission team isn't for the faint of heart. I suppose you can gain a large large following by you know saying well it's easy you know follow me and it'll be easy but there's not much about the christian life that if you've lived any time at all and sought to do it god's way that you find very easy being part of god's mission team isn't for the faint of heart it is challenging it is difficult it can seem overwhelming but i believe you will find the road less bumpy if you will number one accept god's sovereignty number two Access God's power. Number three, acknowledge God's plan. And number three, four, aim for God's target. You see, the apostles of Christ answered their call to mission, I believe, in these ways outlined in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. And they became known as men who did what? Upset the world. Acts chapter 17, verse 6 is part of Paul's encounter there, you know, on his mission work, you know, Paul and the other uh, apostles for Christ in the first century, and it becomes so well known, it becomes so, uh, it grown so much that their opponents referred to them as men who had upset the world. I want you to think for a moment, what do you suppose God could do through you as a as his missionary in your corner of the world. So again, you don't have the same directions from Christ that the apostles had. But again, I, I would say God looks at you as a missionary. If you're a Christian, what do you suppose God could do through you 
as his missionary in your corner of the world. Being a missionary of God in a dark world, and our world certainly qualifies. Being a missionary of God in a dark world is a daunting task. But if you're willing, you may be surprised at what God can do. It's happened before. We just saw that. Once again, I would close from those famous words from the opening credits of the Mission Impossible TV show. Your mission. Should you decide to accept it, will you accept God's mission in your life today? To use another metaphor, but what is what's the, the army slogan? It's the toughest job you'll ever love. I believe it'll work out that way for you. If you choose to accept the mission of God in whatever way God calls you, in, in uh, whatever mission he calls you to, if you're a if you're a mom or dad, you're you have a mission work. If you have a job, you have a mission work. If you're part of a church, you have a mission work. Accept the mission of God and with his help, and by using some of the principles God outlines in his word, I believe it will be a task that, although difficult, will become somewhat easier if we do it the way God has designed it to be done. God bless. Think about these things, and I hope you have a great week.